tonight. Our special coverage as Israeli politicians change their Gaza rhetoric following the World Court's hearings. Assalamu alaikum and good evening. This is Muslim News Canada on Muslim Network TV. I'm Zahra Sayyid. Today is the 97th day since Israel started its indiscriminate attacks on Palestine. Israel has presented its defense at the International Court of Justice in The Hague against South Africa's genocide allegations related to Gaza. While Israel is trying to defend its offensive in the world court, its relentless bombings continue. An Israeli attack on a family home in central Gaza has resulted in the death of 11 people. 13 others have been injured. The main telecommunications operator in Palestine has reported a blackout of all internet and telecom services in Gaza due to bombardment. This is the sixth blackout in the besieged enclave since the onset of Israel's war. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine, Palestinian Refugees says over 330 people sheltering in its facilities have been killed during the ongoing war. 1.4 million people in Gaza are seeking refuge in the agency's facilities. At the time of writing, the death toll in Israeli attacks is 23,708. Another 8,000 Palestinians are presumed dead under the rubble. 60,005 are injured. Israel's revised death toll from Hamas's attacks stands at 1,139. 2,511 Israeli officers and soldiers have been wounded. Tens of thousands of Yemenis in several cities have condemned U.S. and British attacks against the Houthi militants. They are calling the attacks acts of terrorism. They say Houthis should intensify operations on the Red Sea to pressure Israel to lift its Gaza siege. Yemenis hope the international community will end what they describe as a genocidal war on Gaza by Israel. The Houthis say they will continue targeting shipping lanes and firing drones and missiles towards Israel until Israel stops its war against Palestinians. Spain has announced it will not participate in a potential European Union naval mission to protect Red Sea shipping following Houthi attacks. The U.S. has chosen to maintain a no-comments policy on South Africa's petition against Israel at the International Court of Justice. The World Court has been conducting hearings of the case since Thursday. South African lawyer Adila Hassim presented a compelling case. Hassim cited 13 weeks of evidence suggesting a pattern of genocidal acts. The U.S. State Department's deputy spokesperson Vidant Patel declined to speculate on the outcome. He said it is important to not comment on specific points during the hearing. Previously, U.S. officials said that the genocide allegations against Israel are unfounded. Critics argue that the U.S. is overlooking potential war crimes in Gaza. Progressive lawmakers are voicing support for South Africa's petition and calling for accountability. As the International Court of Justice is hearing South Africa's genocide case against Israel, some top Israeli officials have softened their stance on Gaza. Recently, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that Israel has no plans for a permanent occupation of Gaza or the displacement of civilians. He says Israel is targeting Hamas, not the Palestinian population. Netanyahu says that Israeli forces are striving to minimize civilian casualties. Military spokesperson Danny Hagari is echoing Netanyahu's sentiments. He says Israel is committed to minimizing harm to civilians and facilitating humanitarian aid delivery. These claims come amid reports of Israeli military actions targeting schools, homes, hospitals, and religious sites. Israel has also blocked several aid deliveries. The conflict has displaced 1.9 million people in Gaza. Before South Africa's case, Israeli lawmakers have been openly using genocidal rhetoric. Earlier, earlier this month, far-right Minister of National Security Itamir ben Gavir called for the exodus of the people of Gaza. He called for the expansion of illegal Israeli settlements in the territory, calling them the order of the hour. The U.S. Air Force has sent a specialized team to Israel, potentially providing intelligence for airstrikes in Gaza. The team arrived in Israel in late November, a document obtained through the Freedom of Information Act by the online media outlet The Intercept reveals a unique approach of intelligence sharing between the U.S. and Israel. Initially, the deployment was linked to hostage recovery efforts. However, experts say the team of targeting officers may have been tasked with offering satellite intelligence to assist Israel in offensive targeting. 
In the past, the U.S. has put restrictions on military assistance due to the concerns over human rights violations during conflicts. The Biden administration has maintained secrecy about its support for Israel, contrasting with its transparency in aiding Ukraine. This opacity raises questions about the U.S.'s interests and its stance on the Middle East situation. The deployment guidelines were issued by the Pentagon's Air Force Component Command for the Middle East, Air Forces Central. The document provides deployment instructions to air personnel sent to the country. The personnel include an air defense liaison team, as well as airmen assigned as the intelligence engagement officer. An investigation reveals that CNN forwards all war-related reports to the Jerusalem Bureau for review before publication. While this practice is intended to ensure accuracy of reporting, it has raised concerns about the influence of Israeli military censorship on the channel's coverage. The investigation shows CNN's Jerusalem team is working in the shadow of Israel's defense forces. The network's coverage has shaped the channel's coverage of the Gaza war, which includes restrictions on certain topics. While CNN maintains that this policy does not involve direct scrutiny by military censors, it differs from the practice of other major news outlets. CNN has also adopted specific language guidelines for reporting on the violence in Gaza. For this, they've hired a former Israeli soldier as a reporter during the conflict. Critics argue that it is questionable to allow the Israeli government a significant role in deciding the content of news. They're condemning the act especially when Israel has targeted journalists to suppress information. There has long been an agreement between Israeli forces and the CNN's domestic and foreign press that forces journalists to self-censor. Failure to do so results in losing their press credentials. According to Jim Narikas, editor of the watchdog group Fairness and Accuracy, CNN staff in Jerusalem are the people closest to the Israeli government. The UK government's anti-boycott bill, known as the Economic Activity of Public Bodies, has passed its third reading. The bill has garnered 282 votes in favour and 235 votes against it. It is now headed to the House of Lords for further consideration. This legislation aims to prevent public bodies, including local councils, from conducting financial campaigns that involve boycotting Israel, the occupied Palestinian territories and the occupied Golan Heights. Notably, it grants Israel unique legal protection under UK law. Rights groups have strongly criticized the bill. They organized protests outside of Parliament during the vote. Senior Conservative MP Alicia Kearns, chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, has voiced her opposition. She is citing concerns about the bill's impact on free speech, international law, and the UK's global standing. A 41-year-old man in Toronto faces a significant hate crime charge. He is accused of displaying a flag associated with an organization classified as a terrorist group by Public Safety Canada. The incident occurred during a downtown demonstration last weekend. The police have not disclosed details about the flag or the group it represents. Toronto Police Chief Myron Demkew is calling the incident hateful conduct. Chief Demkew has also announced a prohibition on demonstrations on the Avenue Road Bridge over Highway 401. He is citing public safety concerns and the intimidation felt by the surrounding Jewish community. In the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, authorities have stopped payments to more than 21,000 teachers in Muslim religious schools. These religious schools are called madrasas. The teachers were employed to teach subjects like math and science under the government scheme to modernize religious schools. The decision to halt the scheme has raised concerns amongst educators and officials. Iftikhar Ahmed Javed, head of Uttar Pradesh's Madrasa Education Board, is calling the move worrisome. Muslims make up a significant minority in India. They comprise of about 14% of the population, nearly a fifth of Uttar Pradesh's population. Until now, teachers in madrasas received monthly payments from the state and federal governments. The situation is not isolated. Authorities in Assam, another state ruled by the Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party, are converting Muslim religious schools into conventional ones. Thank you for watching. Our news is produced by Muslim Network TV, which is a not for profit organization. We need your support for donations. Please scan the QR code on our broadcast or visit muslimnetwork.tv to donate now so we can continue to amplify the voices of Muslims in Canada and abroad. Assalamu alaikum.